Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And today's Kerbal Space Program video is kind of a spiritual sequel to the video I made last week in which I showcased the amazing Parallax 2 mod by Gameslink. For those that don't know, and I'll put a card on screen to my the video I made last week, but basically the Parallax 2 mod adds loads of realistic ground scatter to every planet and moon in the Kerbal Space Program system. So what this means is that the previously barren surface of planet Places like the Mun and Duna are now scattered with loads and loads of stones, rocks, pebbles and boulders, many of which actually have collision meshes, meaning that you can't just drive through them like many of the ground scatter that comes with, you know, stock Kerbal Space Program. So in stock Kerbal Space Program before Parallax 2, building a rover was fairly trivial. You can just build a box, slap some wheels on the side of it and that's it, right? There's no challenging obstacles that the rover will need to overcome because the ground is basically completely smooth. I know there are hills and slopes and all that, but the actual ground itself doesn't really have any bumps or lumps or any real hazards. But that's not the case with the Parallax 2 mod. So I thought, why don't we try and build some sort of rock crawling rover? A rover that has axle articulation. Uh, so for those that don't really know what I'm, it's really hard to describe what axle articulation is because I guess I just suck at commentaries, uh, but I'll put a picture on screen of what I mean. Basically, as you can see, the axles of a real car can rotate independent of the, I guess, the body of the vehicle itself. And that's what I've done with this car here. I've got the, the actual shell that the Kerbals will sit in with all the science experiments and all that. And then the front and rear axle are attached there you go, good point of the time, that's to showcase this. They're attached by a rotation servo, which means that they can rotate independent of the body of the car, which means that if we're traversing really rough terrain and big boulders, in theory, all four wheels can remain in contact with the ground, even if, you know, each point of contact that the wheels are at are at different heights, like, because it's tra tra traveling over a boulder or something like that. Anyway, that's the, uh, the concept. I've pretty much finished building the rover, actually. I talked throughout the entirety of that build, but let's just do a quick test. Seems to work okay. I just twiddled with the damping slightly of that rear motor to get it working nicely. And as you can see, well, look at all that amazing ground scatter around the Kerbal Space Center. And that concludes the test. Nothing bad happened at the end. So let's get building the rest of this vehicle. Because, well, I guess the vehicle is the rover, but the rest of the craft, because I thought eh, it's a bit of a small rover to just send to Duna for it to be its own video. Let's build a base to go along with the rover. So this is the base here. I've called it the Martian Banana because it looks a bit like a banana, isn't it? Isn't that cool? Isn't that fun? But uh, yeah, uh, it's not like the biggest base or most impressive base by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, again, the focus of this video is kind of A, the amazing Parallax mod. Download it in the description. I implore you if you have a, a computer that won't burst into flames when it runs it, that is. Uh, but yes, this, is, this video is a showcase of the Parallax 2 mod. But it's also a showcase of the rover and my axle articulation system that hopefully works as I intended to. Is that a... Is that an omen? I don't know, you'll have to stick around. Yeah, get that viewer retention up. And guys, if you are enjoying the video so far, then you know I gotta ask you to leave a little like down below. It really helps the channel out and all that. But yeah, that's why the base isn't much to write home about. It's just a fairly simple affair. Although it does have a pretty cool robotic uh, antenna power that will get deployed using a CAL controller. I won't show the programming of the CAL controller because that's quite a boring and tedious thing to just watch. And in fact, to be honest, I think I'm gonna leave the time-lapse bit there, right? Because I think the construction of the rover and the base is the only interesting part of the build, really, because the rest of the rocket, as you can see if I just crossfade over, is just a big dumb booster. And, uh, oh, stay silent for the engine, please. There we are, look at that. It's a big dumb booster. I didn't even bother putting launch clamps on it, so apparently though, the engine bells of those four Mastodon engines are very, very strong. They can support the weight of an entire fully fueled booster, which itself is carrying a Martian base with a rover. So yeah, hats off to whoever engineered those uh, those engines. Yes, that's not much more to say about it though, really. Uh, this is just a pretty bog standard curb in ascent with a very, admittedly, a very absurd looking rocket. Uh, it's very stumpy, looks a bit dumb. It was very overkill to use the massive five meter diameter fuel tanks, which of course are the biggest and widest fuel tanks in the game uh, and are really meant for more heavy payloads, really. But uh, as you can see, the fairing is very wide. 
And if I was going to use a narrower fuel tank, that meant I would have had to use a narrower fairing base. And so the actual neck of the fairing would have been very, very narrow. And they would just have a massive balloon fairing at the top of the rocket. It would have looked, it would have looked even more absurd, I think, than the rocket I actually launched. But the rocket I launched has now pretty much gone. The first stage is over. So now we're left with the upper stage. We can just go back and pretend that the lower stage looked like a more realistic rocket. I don't know. And that's a great that's a great endorsement of the, the content I produce, right? Hey guys, just close your eyes and imagine that the video that you just watched was better. And that's pretty much, you know, how I how I how we do things around here. I called a couple of comments actually uh, on my most recent Kerbal Space Program video saying that they were kind of newer subscribers and they were here from space this week, which is really cool to see, so welcome aboard. But also like I'm aware that like, ah, oh, people like haven't really seen that much of my Kerbal Space Program content, I guess. I mean, 2022, I haven't made that much KSP content, to be honest, guys. I've just had, a, it's been a busy year. It's been a busy, at the, well, I've watched last week's video if you want the full breakdown of what the last hiatus was all about and all the things that was happening. But like, going forward, I don't know how much time I'm going to have to make Kerbal Space Program videos because I'm back at university. I'm doing a master's module. It's like remote, but I'm still having to put a substantial amount of work into studying for this master's module in like a in like prescribing because uh, I work in eyes. So that's kind of like my, my day job. And then I'm going to Bike Park Wales in a few weeks at the end of September. So I'm going to make some sick content for Matt Lound 2. I put a lot of biking content on that channel. Just go subscribe. It's great. Everyone says that they... With, when they watch the Kerbal Space Program videos, they really realize how much they missed my rambling commentaries. And guys, the rambling commentaries are still here. They're on my second channel now. I make like cycling time lapses and I just talk about buying whiskey on them. Like I literally, there is a video on my second channel where I literally just cycle 12 kilometers to go and buy discounted whiskey and talk about utter nonsense. So there you go. Well, there, watch that. Maybe I'll put a card on screen if I remember, but I probably won't. So... Uh, yeah, um, oh my goodness, I talked through the entirety of the planning and execution of my burn from Kerbin to Juna, which, you know, you may have noticed was a fairly trivial affair for me because I launched at a Kerbin to Juna transfer window. And as we all know, a Kerbin to Juna transfer window is when, if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Juna, the angle that line forms at the sun should be about 45 degrees. So if you're planning on going to Juna, Go to the tracking station, time warp, until you get to a point where, again, if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Juna, the angle that that line forms at the sun should be 45 degrees-ish. I, I never really get it bang on, but whatever. I don't know, it's kind of become a bit of a meme, me saying that sentence, but I don't know. This could well be someone's first Kerbal Space Program video of mine watching, and maybe, God forbid, they're using this as a tutorial. Good luck if you're trying to use this video as a tutorial to get to Juna, because I haven't really given any helpful tips so far, aside from, obviously, what I just mentioned, which I think is a crucial thing. And hey, it helps. Like, I bet, I bet the fact that that sentence has become a meme has unironically helped people when they're thinking, oh, I need to get to Juna transfer window. And then that meme just pops into the head. So, you know, I'm going to keep saying it. Um, yeah. And here we are arriving at Juna. I <laughs> talked through the entirety of the interplanetary transfer. But uh, yeah, I, I'm doing a, I'm doing an engine capture rather than an aero capture. A, because aero captures are for 10 noobs, all right? And I'm a pro. And also because I'm an idiot and I brought way too much fuel. I've been on a bit of a hiatus, guys, from Kerbal Space Program. I haven't played it for like two months. And now you get two videos from back to back. How cool is that? But yeah, I've been on a bit of a hiatus. So I kind of wanted to ease myself back in with two more like relatively more simple missions. So a Mun mission last week and a Juna mission this week. And yeah, as you can see, I obviously completely forgot how much Delta V is actually required for a Juna mission. Or I guess a better phrase would be how little Delta V is required for a Juna mission. You don't actually need that much. At least for a, a one-way trip like this is. Um, here we are, by the way, descending now down to the surface of Duna. I didn't really plan any particular biome to aim for. I just did a retrograde burn and crossed my fingers, hope for the best. I put my faith and trust in F5 and F9 if anything went astray. And uh, whoop, there we go. <laughs> it's a bit of a stealth quick load just there. Uh, yeah, I did. I, I messed up the landing the first time. And that's because the landing sequence for this base and rover 
is very dumb, but it's pretty cool. So that's why I did it this way. Basically, we're going to deploy the rover sky crane style. So I'm using the parachutes. I'm, I'm using parachutes to slow my descent and get my get the base and the rover pointing directly towards the ground. I get my retrograde marker pointing straight down. But then we're going to cut the parachutes and complete the descent using the engines. The reason for this is because it allows us to do the sky crane maneuver. Here we go. We're going to hover get as close to the ground as possible without coming into contact with it, drop that rover, and then fly away and land somewhere nearby, which obviously if we had parachutes deployed for that sequence, wouldn't have worked. Trust me, I tried, hence the quick save earlier, <laughs> or the quick load earlier, I should say, and the base did a 360 flip, and, uh, well, I mean, it didn't explode, it worked, but, I mean, I know I don't always strive for realism on this channel necessarily, but I think that was pushing it a little bit. And speaking of realism, or rather not, as you can see, the base was sliding. It wouldn't stop sliding, and I just wanted to do a quick quick save and also detach these side boosters, which are, yeah, I probably should have put beefier engines on them. I thought they would just have enough thrust weight ratio to fly away, but I guess not. But uh, yeah, I then deployed the landing layers again, and we began to slide. Cue the Cuban music. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But yeah, it wouldn't stop sliding, guys. I had to just leave it. I left and made a cup of coffee and watched telly from it and came back upstairs. And it settled at the bottom of this valley. So uh, now we're no longer sliding. I'm going to uh, adjust the spring and damper strength of the base just to kind of get it leveled out so it's a bit more nice for the inhabitants on the base that are going to spend the rest of eternity on the space because goodness knows I'm never coming back for them. <laughs> I've got like so many kerbals just on bases and things. And I'm like, are they stranded? Have I just stranded them there? Because since like 2015, I've been building base on Kerbin and I've never once gone and, you know, done a mission to bring the kerbals back. Whatever. Kerbals love space. We all know that. And hey, there's the cool little electronic, not electronic, sequenced deployment system sequence of the, uh, of the solar panels and the little antenna tower. And then we can bring the rover over to the base and get it tested. You can see the articulation of the axles working a little bit there, but I'm not going to dwell too much on it just yet. I had to unbeach it from a rock because I know you guys want to see it driving around with kerbals on board uh, rather than just being controlled remotely. So let's just get some kerbals inside. I've already put one inside. Let's just get the other one in. And there they are. Let's go. So first things first, I wanted to get a nice shot for the thumbnail. I'm not going to lie, right? The thumbnail is like basically as important as the video itself on YouTube. So we kind of, I kind of wanted to get a good shot showing the base and the articulation of the axles of the rover. So that, oh, let's just try and get it onto a little rock. Oh, how's that? How is that? And if you guys want to know how I'm doing this, by the way, like adjusting the camera angle whilst the world is frozen, basically press escape to pause the game, then press F2 to hide the UI. And uh, yeah, you can move the camera around like that. I don't know if you can do that on console. You probably can. I just I just don't know. Watch my console playthrough if you want to see how inept I am at console KSP. I bought, a, I bought a whole PS4 Pro just for that series. And now I'm just looking at my PS4 Pro now. Hasn't been turned on since the last KSP console video. Because, I mean, I have my own. I have a PS4 for personal use. I bought this one that's, like, for business use. Thinking, oh, if I do live streams, I can just do console KSP. It could be this big thing. But I just, I hate console KSP, it turns out. It's, uh... It's a bit, it's a bit jank. It's a bit janky. Anyway, speaking of jankiness, oh, how was that flip? That's right. It turns out KSP physics, I know, shocker, is not perfect. And it turns out that uh, hitting the rocks just sort of dings the rover back and flips it out. It doesn't just climb over the rocks like a real rover would. Well, I guess a real car would. I mean, the caveat here is that the wheels of this vehicle are made of metal. So I guess they wouldn't like they wouldn't have the same compliance as rubber tires. But still, come on, guys. I think this is a bit ridiculous. It's just flipping me out and spinning me. But then little things like this. How's that up? Oh, I spoke too soon. But did you see for a bit the, the 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 articulation of the axles? It seems to work. Like here, here's a good little shot. Hey, eh? I think that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good confirmation that this concept works. Uh, in theory, <laughs> I quickly backtrack as I see it stop working. But yeah, it's uh, oh, 
Yeah. So I think uh, some work needs to be done. Maybe I should uh, use bigger wheels. I mean, the only wheels bigger than these ones in stock KSP are uh, the massive ones, which are a bit ridiculous. So I thought maybe, you know, what if we tried physical time warp? We just speed up physical time warp and see if that helps. And as you can see, that went about as well as you'd expect. We lost a Kerbal, but we didn't lose the key functions of the rover. It still has its wheels, so I chalked that up as a win. So let's carry on using uh, physical time warp and driving very fast to see if that helps things. Yeah, I don't know why I even questioned that that would be viable. Didn't, didn't really. So uh, yeah, I call this mission a half and half success and failure. Like at one hand, I think the articulation of the axles worked. Uh, here I am, beached. So I, at this point, I then, like, just loaded the rover, just cheated it to a different section of dune to see if it would work somewhere else. And similar sort of results, really. It kind of works, but then occasionally just dings off rocks and, uh, yeah. So I like to think that my, everything I did, everything I did, and everything that Dear Games Links did as well with this amazing mod worked well. But just fundamentally, the physics of Kerbal Space Program... Ah, uh, I have not slain the Kraken this day, let me tell you. But I think this proves the concept. Maybe some fine tuning could be made to get this working a little bit better in future videos. And boy, I've got some big plans for videos with Parallax 2. I've got a Jewel 5 mission in mind that a Discord server member suggested. I'll keep that to myself, but that's going to be happening. Oh, the video's over. Bye.